dynasty. The word is regal, strong. It infers power. In hockey, the word is defined by the 12 Hall of Famers that made the heart and soul of the Montreal Canadiens from 1955 to 1960. They and their teammates established a mark never achieved before or after in the game of hockey, five consecutive Stanley Cup championships. I always said that I, you know, I was at the right place at the right time. Montreal Canadian had quite a hockey team. You know, uh, Belliveau, Jeffrey O, Maurice, my brother, uh, Jacques Plant in the net, and uh, Harvey, Doug Harvey, Dickie Moore. Uh, we had quite a hockey team. That was one of the best that uh, has never been in Montreal, I guess. <laughs> Anytime you played Montreal, you you knew you were going to have a tough game. Eh? Every time you see that red wave, yeah, they, they, they scare you. It was scary. Following the departure of legendary coach Dick Irvin in the spring of 1955, the Canadians were in need of a new face behind the bench. General Manager Frank Selke had to choose between two men, Roger Leger and Toe Blake. Kenny Reardon uh, was one of my dad's assistants at that time, uh, and he convinced my dad. He said, uh, Mr. Selke, he said, uh, uh, I know Roger, I played with him, uh, and he said, I sure know Toe, I played with him. And I said, the one thing about Toe is that he'll control the rocket. He, you rocket will, you'll never have trouble with him if Toe is the coach. So Kenny was right. And let's face it, Toe turned out to be a very, very good coach. That was tough for Toe Blake. He played with the, the rocket, played with uh, Bush Bouchard, played uh, with some guys. Now you're coaching them. And I know it's tough when you coach guys that you played with. And he knew how to do it. He was a natural. You know, the, you know what he told us in his first speech to, on the team when he joined our club? He stood there in front of us and he says, I can't coach you guys. You're too good. Just play your game. And walked away. And what happened? Well, five straight Stanley Cups. Correct. Unbelievable. Toe Blake's first year behind the bench saw the team win an unprecedented 45 games, with the courageous Jacques Plante stoning the opposition and the fiery rocket striking fear in the hearts of opposing goaltenders. The Canadians stormed into the playoffs, losing only two games while capturing the first of their five consecutive Stanley Cups. Me, two premières années. Euh, nous avons perdu la Coupe Stanley contre Détroit en 16 joutes. Mais une de ces septièmes joutes était en supplémentaire. Euh, évidemment, il y a eu un grand désappointement. Mais on avait fourni l'effort. Euh, ça aurait pu aller d'un côté ou de l'autre. Et euh, je pense qu'on s'est repris par après. Charles Plant. Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, he was the greatest goaltender that ever played, at least during my time. Uh, first of all, I played with him with the Montreal Canadiens, and of course we won five Stanley Cups in a row, so you can't beat a record like that. C'était un gardien but, était très très bon. Tout ce qui, tout ce que les défenses, il disait aux défenses, au toit dans le chemin, je veux voir la rondelle. Si elle voyait, il l'arrêtait. À mon gars, mon idée à moi, Jacques Plante est le meilleur gardien de but que j'ai jamais passé dans la Ligue nationale. Vous pouvez en nommer n'importe quel dans mon livre à moi, Jacques Plante. When the rock was on the ice, he had to score or we had to win the game. That's all. He was not satisfied if we come in the, the, the room after the third period, we lost the game, he'd really be mad. Five minutes later, boom, he scored a goal. And then looking at him, and he got fire in his eyes. He gave me more trouble than anybody. He'd be lying on his back, and he'd still be trying to put that puck in the net. And it, it, was, uh, it was beautiful to watch. With the team playing its finest hockey, the players meshed. It no longer became enough to want to win. These players needed to win. It was this drive, the depth of talent, and the solid coaching that kept the team on top. We just felt that every time we step on the ice, we'd win during those five Stanley Cups. And it was a great feeling because you had so much confidence. But we stayed together as a team. We were really a family because we all grew up, we all knew each other, the wives knew each other. It makes it easy. 
Well, the guys stuck together a lot, you know, it was a family. And that's what made the Montreal the force of the, the team from Montreal. Everybody started to gel. On a eu beaucoup de plaisir, au point de vue euh, d'unité d'équipe, au point de vue de l'enthousiasme des joueurs. Yeah, we expected to win. And uh, when, as I say, when you didn't, it, uh, it hurt a little bit. And we were like a family, you know, growing up together. And, and only like the, the uh, Toe Blake, the only time you can have fun, you have to win. And that was the theory of our whole team. With the Rockets' retirement in 1960, the city's dream of a sixth straight Stanley Cup would be only that, a dream. The Canadians' dynasty that had dominated the league for the last half decade had ended. It was pretty obvious that uh, with Rocket retiring, uh, the heart of the team was, if not gone, it was damaged. Uh, not only was he a marvelous player, a uh, driving force, a, a leader, um, he also was very physically intimidating. Uh, he didn't fool around with Rocket. All in all, it's what you get out of the game. and. Really, no money can buy the fun we had playing hockey for the Montreal Canadiens. It is, it is and always will be the greatest organization of any hockey league. Well, I don't know if anybody will ever beat the record, but I know it'll at least take them five years. with the Montreal Canadiens would a group of players numbering Jean Beliveau, Henri Richard, and Ivan Cornway among the ranks be tagged as the Forgotten Dynasty. But the team that won four Stanley Cups from 1965 to 1969 has received such a moniker. The remarkable 50s dynasty left some large shoes to fill. Now, a lot of them are gone. You know, the, the Rockets gone, Jacques Plant's gone, Bernie Jeffrey's gone, Doug Harvey's gone, Dickie Moore is gone. They're all, they're, it's a totally new team that was built up. Uh, heck, they didn't even get to the finals in, in the previous four. You know, the finals, <laughs> you lose one series. I mean, you only had to win one series to get to the finals in those days with the six-team league. But they didn't get to the finals. Nobody fired Toe Blake, by the way. As it, uh, he would have been fired today, probably, the way these guys operate, the owners. And without the, if the Leafs don't win in 67, there's another five in a row. But that period in the 60s uh, doesn't really get the same amount of attention. Now, one of the reasons is that the last two cups in that stretch were when they beat the St. Louis Blues in the finals. But, you know, when, they, when the team, when the expansion, that was part of the expansion deal, that for the first three years, one of the new teams would get make it into the Stanley Cup final. And it turned out to be St. Louis each of the three years. First two years they play Montreal, third year they play Boston. Like Bellevue talks about that team, we almost won five times in a row, and and we're not putting the same group as the other guys who won five in a row, but you know, and like like Harper and Teddy Harris and LaRose and Baxter and Ferguson, boy, we had a gutsy team that you know, uh, I mean, Chicago was the team that we had to bring down, right? Okay, the, and, and we did. The '60s dynasty was anchored by Jean Bellevue, who by then was a legend in the NHL. Built on the rock-solid foundation of the farm system that Frank Selke had developed since the 40s, the Habs of the 60s were the beneficiaries of a steady stream of talent. You, you take a look at, uh, at their approach uh, to the game and, uh, and even, even in expansion, you know, what a great job they did in expansion because they kept players where the other teams didn't and they signed uh, all the young kids and they did a great job. They still had the franchises which developed their, their own players and, and, be, and they belonged to them, they, they, they couldn't go anywhere else. Uh, this is what you're going to look at this different uh, today. So therefore, there was always some new blood coming up with, that, with talent. Good players, good management, good coaching, 
Yep, they had everything. They really did. Euh, on gagne la Coupe Stanley, la septième game contre Chicago. Euh, mais elles sont toutes importantes. Je pense que euh, on va sur la rue Sainte-Catherine. Euh, C'est notre, notre parade de fin d'année. C'était quasiment devenu un, un rendez-vous avec, euh, avec les amateurs de hockey à, à la fin de l'année de dire on va se rencontrer sur la rue Sainte-Catherine euh, avec la Coupe Stanley. Mais euh, j'ai été vraiment choyé euh, avec euh, les spectateurs qu'on qu a eus premièrement et le support qu'on a eu. Mais euh, à Montréal, je pense que c'est la plus belle ville de, de hockey pour, euh, pour jouer. By 1965, Toll Blake had a wealth of experience that could not be beaten. For Blake, success bred more success. And when Sam Pollock arrived, the team really took off. Toll Blake was a fantastic man. Uh, first of all, he, he was alone. Uh, nobody to help him, uh, who had no video uh, to watch. And, uh, but he hated to lose. Uh, he gave us that, that winning, uh, winning feeling in the room. And uh, he really respect his player. And the same was with with Sam Pollock. You know? Like he knew hockey inside out. He knew which guys could play. Which guys could play when it counted. Like, there's a difference. Toe always said to me that he thought that the team of the 60s was the most underrated team that he ever coached. That it was better than any than the history books give it credit for. The Cup in 1965 kicked off the dynasty run, and it started something else. That was the first year of the Conn Smythe Trophy, honoring the most valuable player of the playoffs, and the first honoree was Jean Beliveau. On avait entendu parler que la Ligue avait décidé euh, euh, d'honorer euh, le propriétaire des euh, livres de Toronto euh, avec euh, ce trophée. J'étais bien heureux euh, de le gagner. Ça confirmait que j'avais dû avoir de, de, de bonnes séries. Et aujourd'hui, je suis bien heureux euh, d'avoir été le premier. And then I go and see John and say, John, if you saw anything special you want me to do, he said, Nah, you'll know what to do. So I said, This is good. I like this, right? And then we won in the seventh game against Chicago. Okay. Bellamy scored with 11 seconds, and I scored with about uh, before. I think before we came off the ice, I don't think it was two minutes old. We made it two nothing. The Canadians get it again. Here's Bellamy going in with Duff over to Duffy. Should he score? And the Montreal Canadiens lead two to nothing. A key element in building the dynasty was the initial toughening up of the team with players such as John Ferguson and Terry Harper. So that, that team of the 60s, uh, the whole new breed had arrived, you know, the Terry Harpers of life, and, and uh, Ralph Backstrom had become a solid player, and, and all, you know, th th it's funny, but that's how what you have to do. You know, they, they couldn't win in, in the mid to late 60s with the same team that won in the late to 50s, you know, and, and they just had to make changes. The fly in the ointment for the Habs was the Stanley Cup final of 1967. The Canadians went into that final against one of the oldest teams to have battled for a cup, the 1967 Toronto Maple Leafs. Their veterans, especially goaltenders Johnny Bauer and Terry Sawchuk, wrested the cup from the Canadians, stopping the run of four in the middle. In 67, I always kid the guys and try to say, oh, wow, well, we had the expo there in Montreal, so it was Canada's birthday, we'll let you have the cup, and we come back and took it back twice again right after. Fast, in case we forgot how to do it. There were 14 players on every team during the dynasty of the 60s. Ralph Backstrom, Jean Beliveau, Ivan Cornoyer, Dick Duff, John Ferguson, Terry Harper, Ted Harris, Jacques Leperrier, Claude Provo, Henri Richard, Bobby Russo, Gilles Tremblay, Jean-Claude Tremblay, Gump Worsley. And even today, those names carry memories of the spectacular 1960s Montreal Canadiens. I used to always figure when we used to get on those trains from Montreal or, and we were driving downtown to the rink, I said, boy, these guys start every game a goal and a half ahead, you know, with this guy sitting in their dressing room, this big number four. And when I got there, I said, oh, these other guys, I know what they're thinking. <laughs> They're already down a goal and a half before we start this game, and we're going to make sure they're down two and a half goals real fast. And so they all know, say, see you later, goodbye. We ended a lot of games in the first five minutes in Montreal, plenty.
Montreal Canadiens themselves are careful, others are not. They have been called the fastest, the most skillful, the greatest hockey team of all time. They are the Canadians of the 1970s. The 70s team was built on speed, finesse. Uh, you know, that number one line of Lafleur, uh, Shutton, and Lemaire, uh, if they're on, uh, pretty hard to shut them down. I don't think there's ever been a team in hockey that had three defensemen play as many games as those guys played for that particular organization, for one organization, and it all end up in the Hockey Hall of Fame. De 75 à 80, uh, on, on a eu toute une équipe. Uh, premièrement, Guy Lafleur, dans mon livre, à moi, était numéro un au monde. Uh, on avait trois superstars à la défense. On avait Dryden aussi dans le filet. It did not come about instantly. The Canadians' dynasty of the 60s came to an end with the retirement of players and the natural transition of the team. The 70s required rebuilding. Oui, ce fut le changement de l'année 1970. En 70, 69, 69, 70, le Canadien n'a pas fait ses séries éliminatoires. Il y a eu un gros ménage parmi les joueurs. On a laissé partir plusieurs vétérans. On était une dizaine de jeunes qui sont arrivés pour se joindre aux Canadiens en 70-71. Et c'est là qu'il y a eu un point tournant, l'arrivée de Ken Dryden. L'échange de Frank Mavlich avec Detroit a été exceptionnel pour l'organisation du Canadien, pour les séries éliminatoires cette année-là. You had some players who were kind of reached the end of the line around that time, John Ferguson, John Beliveau, you know, that era, the 60s era, and you had the new, the little fleurs of life, Cornway becoming established, LeBaire becoming established now, that took the team, carried the team on into the 70s. It goes back to uh, Sam Pollock's uh, drafting ability uh, and with the, the, the scouts that they had and the farm system they'd set up uh, across Canada it was phenomenal. He has the potential to be a great young hockey player and of course uh, we brought him in uh, here uh, uh, two or three games ago and uh, tonight he came up with uh, well, two big goals and what was our biggest game of the year so you know that, that really helps and of course that's uh, the strong point of our club is to have players like that and come in to deliver in the pinch. And you know, the year that Larry and I got drafted in 71, it was Lafleur first, uh, Arneson seventh, myself eleventh, Larry twentieth, Michel de Guise, Terry French, and that was just in the first 24. That would be like six picks in the first round now. And the next year they had another five, and the next year they had another four. Each of the dynasties had a player that rose above the rest, sometimes on the ice, sometimes off, but always in the hearts and minds of the fans. Just as the 50s had Rocket Richard and the 60s Jean Beliveau, many saw that potential in 1971's first draft pick, Guy Lafleur. And all of a sudden, you hear you got a young kid coming from uh, from Thurso, Quebec, played in Quebec City, was a was a king, and still is a king in Quebec City, and he's got to fill these fill these gates of this of Big John. And so I think there was a, although he won't admit it, I think there was a tremendous amount of pressure on, on, on Guy to, you know, to be the next leader. The pieces really began to come together when Scotty Bowman arrived behind the bench in 1971. That was one thing about Scotty, he, he, he could read a bench and he could fit you into a role and he took the guys who were going that night and that's who played. Scotty always found some kind of motivation, even though we clinched a playoff spot, clinched first place in our division, clinch first place overall. There was always something out there, some sort of thing that he would bring in and say, okay guys, uh, you know, if we do this, the next two games, we'll have the most points in history. C'est un gars qui, qui, qui imposait énormément de respect. C'est un gars qui, uh, qui allait chercher le maximum. The young Guy Lafleur struggled to meet expectations. In what some thought was an effort to change his luck, Lafleur removed his helmet for the start of the 1974-75 season. Whether or not that helped, the transformation was almost immediate. Six straight 100-plus point seasons. It took about two or three years of, of getting experience and getting to know the league until he finally took off and had, uh, he, he definitely, you know, when you look at players from different decades, and you, he was definitely the, the player of the 70s. If si, uh, Boris Richard was the hargne, if si Béliveau was the elegance, Guy Lafleur was the panache. When he descended on his head, and he was doing all the patinoire, and he was marking in the left corner, the filet, 
euh, c'était, euh, je pense que quand on parle de la fleur, c'était l'image qui donnait tout ça avec les cheveux au vent et tout ça. Euh, c'était le panache. Guy Lafleur était le meilleur joueur du monde, as far as I'm concerned, pour une période de 5 ou 6 ans dans les années 70. Et la façon dont il pouvait performer de cette façon est quelque chose que je ne vais jamais oublier. C'est ce qui l'a fait à part. He never, never took a night off. I mean, it was just night after night after night. He would, it was just amazing. With Guy Lafleur finding his stride on a line with Steve Shutt and Jacques Lemaire, and bolstered by a defensive corps that featured the likes of Larry Robinson, Guy Lapointe, and Serge Savard, and with Ken Dryden in the nets, the Montreal Canadiens were unstoppable. You know what, at the time, but you really know it afterwards. I mean, how good they were, and 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 right through the lineup. I mean, that that we would have been an awful team to play against. I mean, it would have been so discouraging to be another team playing against us. C'était une équipe qui voulait gagner, qui avait toujours quelqu'un qui était pour se surpasser à chaque soir. Il y avait les les forces étaient dans tous les niveaux, à toutes les 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 positions. Et euh, pour nous. Euh euh, on savait qu'on qu qu était fort défensivement, dans le filet, offensivement, et euh, chaque joueur savait ce qu'il avait à faire. Et il le faisait très, très bien. They knew they weren't going to lose. Didn't matter where you were. They weren't going to lose. They, they, they lost a few games, but not many. And their record, when you add it up, and I haven't got it in my head at all, but when you add up the total number of games, including playoffs that they played, and the total number of wins, and the total number of losses, it's amazing what that team accomplished in through, through that four-year period. Perhaps the defining moment for this dynasty came in 1977 when they established two incredible regular season team records, records that still stand today, a 132-point season and only eight losses. Eh bien, la, la confiance, d'abord, je pense qu'on avait perdu euh, 10 ou, ou 8 matchs durant la saison. Alors, euh, ça m'a peut-être permis euh, d'avoir peur de perdre après et de permettre de gagner euh, peut-être plus de, de Coupe Stanley. They found so many ways to win, and they could play any way you wanted to play. If you wanted, okay, if you're, you want to play a little skill game tonight, we'll play you. If you want to play a little aggressive tonight, uh, you know, the Bob Gainies and uh, Larry's would turn their game and, and they'd play any way you wanted to play. If you are that other team, you've got to believe that there's a certain strategy that you can use that will win you the game. And you say to yourself, well, we can outscore these guys. No, you can't. Or we can outdefend them. No, you can't. Or, or we can, you know, we can outmuscle them and then we'll get them that way. No, you can't. You, know, you play any game you want and we had an answer. But we did our job, you know. We were supposed to win games. We were supposed to win the Stanley Cup. And so it was a great accomplishment. And you, you sit back and you say, yeah, we did what we were supposed to do. And that's always a very good feeling. The team lost key components after 1979 with the retirements of Ivan Cornway, Jacques Lemaire, and Ken Dryden. Scotty Bowman left for Buffalo, and the Habs dynasty was no more. Whether the dynasty of the 70s was the greatest, that will be debated in the taverns of Montreal for a long time to come. Were they great? Of that, there is no doubt.